Um, it's great to be back in Canada. This work was, in fact, done at Imperial College London because I only moved here about two months ago. Um, I'm based at SFU now in the math department with collaborations in statistics and biology there and obviously public health here. Um, okay, so this is not a hardcore bioinformatics talk. Uh, I would love to get into like nuts and bolts of comparing to burn drops, but I haven't, so I'm not going to talk about that. Um, but I do want to talk about SNP thresholds um, and you know, why we use them, why we might not want to just use them. After we use them, what do we get and what do we do? Okay, so the context here is imagine that we want to understand transmission of a pathogen from one person to another person. And that can happen by different routes. As you know, you can cough on your friend or touch your friend um, and transmit pathogens on spots or respiratory different ways. And typically, we don't know who infected whom. We can guess by asking who you lived with, who you're in close contact with, were they infected at the right time. We can kind of reconstruct that. It's hard to do. Um, and we don't always know the sort of underlying truth. Um, and in TB in particular, TB can last for a long time in the body without being infectious. Um, it can be infectious kind of on and off. Um, the time periods are long, months to years. Oh, do I need to speak into here? Okay. Don't love the recording, I have to say. Um, okay. TB. It takes a long time, potentially. If I, if I turn up today with flu, you're probably, you know, confident that it's not the flu I got two years ago. But if I turn up today with TB, I might have been infected with TB a long time ago. So in some pathogens, chronic pathogens, HCV, HIV, TB, other long-term pathogens, it's hard to understand from timing and location who's transmitting, what variant is being transmitted, when it's being transmitted, where it's being transmitted, and what are determinants of who's transmitting and who's receiving. Um, and we have sequences, as you know, because you are a bioinformatics group and sequencing is cheap now than cheaper now than it was 10 years ago. And there are lots of sequences and we can make lots of trees and we can ask ourselves, what did those trees tell us about the underlying ecology of the spread of the bug? And in particular, this question of who infected whom. Okay. So we first kind of got into this. I think people got into it with HIV and looking at kind of episodic transmission and sequences from the pole gene. And people kind of thought, you know, okay, we have this big tree and we're going to sequence lots of things. And if two cases are really closely related, then that suggests that they're a transmission pair. So that kind of makes sense. I made up these names. They're completely random. Um, so, but these two, Rohana and Shannon, are a pair on this phylogeny. And I think naively people might have thought, okay, we'll get all our sequences and then we'll know who infected whom because we'll be able to trace back the past ancestry. That's what a phylogenetic tree is. It traces past ancestry through time. And through that past ancestry, we'll be able to tell the story of did Rohana infect Shannon and who infected Archie and Yasmin and Pippa? Was that, you know, Gafreed and, and whoever? So, so that goes through. But of course, if you sequence lots of people, most of the people in the outbreak, then you can observe that you could infect lots of your friends. But if you make sequences into a binary tree, you can only be in a pair with one other person at most. And you may not be in a pair with anyone here. Greg is not in a pair uh, with anybody else. So for that reason and, and many others, I think one or two of which I'll get to later, um, we can't just read off the story of who infected whom from um, phylogenies. Uh, and so genomics, having genomic data, especially for TB where variation tends to be low, does not directly reveal transmission, um, who infected whom. Um, so one reason it doesn't reveal it is this pairs thing I just talked about. Another reason is that people might have diverse infections, so you might not be able to, to sample exactly the ancestral pathogen that was transmitted from your friend to yourself. Um, we may not know a lot about times of diagnosis. They may not be informative. There might be missing cases. Um, we don't know what the bottlenecks are. How many bugs are you transmitting from person to person? All of those things complicate the relationship between getting sequence data, running it through our variant calling pipelines, and then inferring from that who infected whom. Okay, here's one more. Let me just flip through. Yeah, okay, good. Um, so here's a little cartoon with three characters. Um, I'm calling them orange hair, green hat, and gray head. I drew them with my iPad. Um, okay, and each one has a little tree beside it. 
And the little tree is a schematic of the pathogen phylogeny inside that person. So this person had quite a complex, diverse um, fictional infection with this blue tree. And this lineage of it got transmitted to, to gray head, and this lineage got transmitted to orange head, and orange hair, a green head and orange hair. So if I draw the true phylogeny, this is the true phylogeny, right? I glued the, the blue tree and the tree from orange hair and the tree from green head together. Um, and if I just sampled, say, this lineage, this one, and this one, let's see if I have it, no, I don't have a slide for that. So let's imagine these bottom ones here are sampled. I sampled this, got to the doctor, sampled this one, sampled this one, sampled this one. Now what happens is these two are in a pair, but actually neither of them infected the other. They were both infected by gray head. So the possible transmission trees given this phylogeny is actually, there's a large set of possible things. Even with three people, it's not the case that these being close necessarily means one infected the other one. Okay, so that's the context. What we would like to do is build tools to take lots of sequences and understand not only did green hat infect orange hair, but did people like green hat tend to infect people like orange hair? How long did it take? When did it happen? Where did it happen? Those kinds of questions. Um, okay, so one of the first steps, if you have all your sequence data, is to divide your sequences into so-called transmission clusters or putative transmission clusters. And typically what people do with TB and with other pathogens is they say, okay, let's call the variants. How many are there? Are there 12 SNPs between you? Yep, less than that. Okay, good, you're in the same cluster. More than that, okay, not so good, you're not in the same cluster. And 12, I think, is becoming the community accepted standard of the amount of TB that we can think of as in the same cluster. 12 SNPs, you're in. More than 12, you're out. Boom. Um, some people, you know, take location into account or they... Um, okay, so here's a table that, um, and, and Public Health England is, sorry, now sequencing all of the TB in the UK routinely as part of the routine microbiology that's going to be done, and this is what they're doing. And the outbreak reconstruction team only sees variants that are within 12 of each, SNPs of each other. They don't see anything else, and the genomics team holds all the data that are sort of separate from the outbreak team. Uh, so if something's 13 SNPs away, but one of those SNPs was an accident, yeah, too bad, you're out of the cluster, you're not there. Okay, this table shows um, different SNP thresholds that people have used in TB in different literature. Um, so some people might sort of say, okay, if it's less than this, we confirm transmission, but if it's outside an upper threshold, we say it can't be transmission. And those numbers literally range from two to a thousand, um, which is a big range, keeping in mind that they're actually, nobody would use these two and a thousand for the same purpose. Um, but if you just look at what SNP thresholds people have said for TB, even though a lot of the community loves the number 12 right now, there actually hasn't been historically a lot of consensus on what that number should be. Um, so I thought it would be great to have a probabilistic alternative to this, where we don't just say 12 or not, in or out, where we actually do some modeling and think about the probabilities and think about what we mean by being in a transmission cluster. And some of the motivations for doing that are listed here. So, if you think about what goes into a SNP distance, what makes two isolates of TB from two different patients a certain SNP distance apart? Well, you have your mutation process by which mutation diversity is generated. Then you have whether that diversity becomes a substitution that gets detected in your data. So that's like a whole, this is two lines, so it's a whole complex set of assumptions and processes. Um, you have your time elapsed between being infected and infecting someone else. So how long is the opportunity for these processes to happen? Um, you have your selection. Not all SNPs are the same. Some SNPs are housekeeping SNPs. Some SNPs are in highly variable regions that might occur faster. Some SNPs are SNPs that confer resistance to drugs that are being used in your community. Uh, those maybe we don't want to treat as just the same as every other SNP. Um, In-host diversity. Uh, you guys are probably intimately aware of changes in software that calls SNPs, that does assembly, that does alignment, that does trimming, that does quality filtering. Those things may change. Um, I didn't put, it's like maybe so obvious I didn't even put it here, the sequencing platform itself may change. We don't know whether Nanopore or PacBio 12 SNPs would be the right thing because they will get longer reads which will capture variation in different regions and so on and also sampling and culture methods. So all of these things go into what makes a SNP a SNP. 
And as we change technologies, we may want a way to think about what that 12 SNPs is going to turn into in a, in a principled way. Okay. So here's our transmission probability alternative to SNP cutoffs. So what we do is we think, okay, what do we mean by a transmission cluster? Well, what we really mean is, is transmission sort of local, happening now? I care about it enough to go do the second part of my talk, which is on how you reconstruct outbreaks given transmission clusters. Um, so the, the idea is really to decide whether two people are in a cluster based on the probable number of intermediate transmission events between them. So there's a certain amount of evolutionary time, not just the time between diagnosis of case A and B, but between the whole evolutionary time separating their isolates. How many transmissions was that? And what do you want to do as a public health person to split that into cases? And we do it this way. So we know the number of SNPs n, and maybe we also know something about whether some subset of those are under selection. We think we know something, even if it's a messy, yucky clock process, we think we know something about a clock process, which we'll call lambda, and a person-to-person -person jump from the pathogen. So the pathogen's going along, it's going through the outbreak, it goes bounce to a new person, bounce to a new person, bounce to a new person. How long does that take? We think we know something about by knowing the pathogen, flu, weeks, days, TB, not so much weeks, certainly not days. Okay, so what we do is we obtain a probability of that there were K transmissions on the path, the total evolutionary time between the two sequences, given how many SNPs there were and given these assumptions about what the processes are. And we place two cases in different clusters if the probability that there were more than 10 transmissions between them is high enough, for example. We put them in the same cluster if the probability that there were more than 10 is low enough. Okay, so that's the whole idea. If you like math, here comes some math. Um, okay, so here's a schematic. Again, here are my two cases, sequence one and sequence two, very creatively named. Um, we call the time between their detection delta, so this is the time at which case one was sequenced, time at which case two was sequenced, and then we imagine that there's some unknown amount of evolutionary time that happened in between. So this is H over 2, and we don't know this. So what we do is we write down its likelihood, given our model, and then we estimate if it was this number here, how many transmissions would there probably have been, and then we integrate out this uncertain number H. So we figure out our likelihood of H, figure out if it was H, how much, trans how much transmission would that be if this was five years, and we think the pathogen is moving from person to person every year. That might be on average five transmissions, but it might be quite uncertain. So we can look at the probability that there were 10 transmissions. Okay, and then in our, the work I'm going to present, we use 10 and 0.8. So the probability that cases are separated by uh, greater than 10 transmissions, this should be, this should be different, sorry. Um, it has to be less than 0.8 to put in the same cluster. Okay, so 10 and 0.8. Uh, you're going to get math. Before you get math, I like to tell you what all the letters mean. You don't have to remember this. It doesn't matter. But <clears throat> it's uncomfortable to give you math without telling you what the letters mean. H, you just saw, that tells us the time, the evolutionary time. Capital K is the number of transmissions that are separating our cases. N is the number of SNPs. M is some other number of SNPs about resistance, resistance SNPs. Um, Lambda is our molecular clock assumption, our model, not just a constant rate, it could be something more general. And then we have another lambda where we might have a faster assumption for sites under selection. And then beta is our kind of epidemiology understanding of how often the pathogen is going to move from host to host along its lineages in the tree. Okay. So we're going to say, that it, say it in words and then we're going to say it in math. So the probability that there are at least K transmissions between our two cases has to depend on the time elapsed and on the transmission process beta. And the time elapsed it depends on the time between the cases, the delta, the H, and so that's the, that gives us the time elapsed, the number of SNPs in the clock process. So we use this part to write down the likelihood for the time H of divergence. That depends on our case timing, our number of SNPs, and our clock. And then from that, we get the probability for the number of transmissions that are in between. So the probability that our number, capital K, is bigger than little k. All right, so that just says in words, 
in math what this said in words about what depends on what. Okay. So now we might want to model selection. That, that didn't, this part didn't have the selection in it. Notice there were no M's in here. So if we put selection in it, we modeled that sites conferring resistance to antibiotics, especially antibiotics that are in use in the community in which your data are coming from, um, they might have more SNPs than other sites. And in fact, estimates of the kind of baseline rate of SNP acquisition in TB are about half a SNP per genome per year normally, and up to about 10 times that for uh, sites that are associated with resistance. Um, however, in TB, because there's relatively low diversity overall, and for other reasons, well, and because resistance can be transmitted, even these SNPs that are associated with resistance can still be informative of transmission. So we don't want to just forget about them and delete them because they actually do carry information about transmission. Um, so we'd say, okay, we can write down the probability that there are M resistance SNPs and N regular SNPs in a time T, assuming they're accrued independently given the total time, and we can use that in our model. The intuition is basically that if you model a faster rate for your resistance SNPs, then each of those resistance SNPs adds less divergence time because they happen at a faster rate. So it takes less time for them to happen. Okay, so here's the method. We estimate this divergence time using our special rate for resistance SNPs. We estimate the number of transmissions given that divergence time. And then we integrate out our uncertain divergence time to figure out the probability that there were how many transmissions and then we place them in the clusters accordingly. That's kind of the same slide, so I'll take that away. Here's some results. Um, this is, delta is the time between the cases. Um, so when there's no, they're measured at the same time, and there are four SNPs, and we've used some kind of baseline, twice as fast as TB kind of parameter for um, the clock. Then actually, even with, uh, four SNPs, you can get quite a huge range in the number of estimated transmissions between the cases, with a peak at around eight-ish. And then it sort of goes up as the cases get farther and farther apart in time, you imagine that there are more and more intervening cases. Um, and here's the same thing for N is eight SNPs, you get these giant blob violin plots um, and here it actually, the, the time between the cases delta doesn't matter so much, uh, and then it starts going up when it gets really long. And I think this is probably in years, if it's TB. Um, okay, here's some data from here in BC from my wonderful collaborator, Jen Gardy, who you heard from a minute ago. Um, and we just compare our SNP cutoff method to our transmission method. Each little dot is a case and the circles around them are the clusters that we get if we use our SNP cutoff um, with nine SNPs as the cutoff and our transmission method with 11 intermediate transmissions as the cutoff. And what you can see, you know, it's a little bit reassuring. Um, you can actually get pretty much the same clustering uh, between these two. All these cases are in the same cluster in both and all these cases are in both and these guys are in the same cluster. We have one yellow one um, who jumped from cluster to cluster when we started thinking about timing and transmission as well as just SNPs. And then if we refine, of course, the, as you shrink your cutoffs, you expect to get more and more smaller clusters. And these break up in very different ways as you do that. So you can get the same SNP cutoffs that you know and love. If you're a public health person who loves 12 SNPs, then you can get that out of this method. Um, but it also gives you the flexibility to think about how you're using your epidemiology information and your timing information. Um, so in our lambda and beta process, we can capture non-strictly clock-like processes of variation happening or of people transmitting to their friends. Um, okay, so it gets a little more interesting, I would say, when we look at uh, drug resistance. So this is a data set um, of about a hundred and some cases from the Republic of Moldova sampled in the same hospital over about a six month period. And this is data from Ted Cohen and Valerio Croda. And actually what we were asked was, is there some principled way we can define cluster A and say it's really a cluster when the SNP cutoff isn't 
really that well supported, especially in areas where there's a lot of resistance and a lot of resistance SNPs. Um, so the answer after doing all this math was yes, cluster A is really robustly supported across lots of different choices of this. So here we have our SNP method and our transmission method and you can kind of see that as you change things around, cluster uh, C starts to break up in different ways and cluster B starts to break up in different ways. So these are ones that are maybe not as well supported that you would want to think a little bit more about in terms of if you want to be inclusive and, and sort of cautious that way, you want to put these guys in with cluster B um, and so on. And here D, this is telling us that this blob here, the little pale gray guy might actually be in cluster D, um, which wouldn't have been seen with the SNP cutoff. Um, so our you know, positive answer for the collaborators is yes, K, clade A is really a big deal. You should worry about it. It's a strongly robustly supported transmission cluster according to all of these things. And it turns out it's kind of a novel MDR cluster that they're seeing circulating in the Republic of Moldova. So it's important to be able to say yes, we can support that without just sort of arbitrarily taking a 12 SNP threshold from Tim Walker's paper in Oxford and applying it to the Republic of Moldova. Um, okay, we also adapted this to take into account the, um, the region. So this is back to our data for BC again. Um, this is a picture of some data from BC from, from Jen. Each dot is a case and um, this is our transmission based clusters for T equals three. So putting things together if we think that there, the probability there are three or fewer transmissions between them is greater than 80%. So that's that. But then if we start saying, okay, let's think about what region they were in and add a little penalty for transmitting across regions, then we can pick up a couple of other distinct clusters here from region 1A. And I'm sure it's private what these regions are. So they're just different parts, different places around BC. And we can pick up this other little cluster from region, I guess also from region 1A. And that's something that doesn't emerge if you just do a SNP cutoff because there's no real principled way to take that location into account. Okay. So, how long do I have? 20 minutes, okay. Cool. Uh, so now we have groups of sequences and we've divided them into transmission clusters. And we're gonna move into part two of the talk. Um, now what? I mean, that doesn't, like I said, you don't have sequences you, that directly tell you who infected whom, but maybe you want to understand something about the dynamics of transmission between these cases. Um, and we think we probably have missed some cases. Certainly implicit in this transmission, intermediate transmission thing is that there are cases out there potentially for whom we don't have sequences, either because we know about them and they failed culture or we don't have sequences or because we don't know about them at all and they're out there in the community possibly having recovered or moved or continuing to infect uh, their contacts. So what, what I want to describe is our, we, we invented a Bayesian method to take all of that into account, given a tree, given one transmission cluster, and build an inference of who infected whom using the sequence data. So on the uh, right here, this is a zoom in of one of the trees that we get and you can make these so you can click on the nodes and like move them around, but I'm not gonna, it's just fun, it doesn't add any information I don't think. Um, this is a schematic of an outbreak from Hamburg uh, published in 2013 and we just mapped, you know, sampled status to color so gray is unsampled and the width is the posterior probability of the edge and so on, so we can tell you more about that later. Um, this method takes in-host diversity and unsampled cases into account and allows some flexibility in the underlying model. Okay, so here's how it works. So people can have more than one branch of the phylogeny inside them at a time. That's the diversity. So here's a little schematic. This is a phylogeny. We imagine that it is true. We know it. We have a magical, wonderful bioinformatics method that you all write for us that um, this timed tree is, is like God's truth or something. We don't really, but we can talk about that more later. But imagine now we do, this is true, it's in units of time. Each host has a unique color and the transmission events are at these color changes. So the story of this outbreak is case eight was unknown, we never sampled a sequence. Eight infected four, we sampled four. Four infected three who we never sampled and three infected both one and two. 
Eight also infected seven who we never sampled, and seven infected both five and six. Okay. So what we do is we make this tree, take our fixed input tree, propose a coloring, compute its likelihood, accept or reject, propose a new coloring, compute its likelihood, accept or reject, and we proceed by MCMC. And at the end, we have a posterior collection of these things. Of course, we don't actually color them in. We use computers to do that. <clears throat> okay, so I'll tell you a little bit about what we do to get the likelihood. Um, I've just told you color changes are transmission events. So now that we have you know, this tree divided up into all the person-to-person -person transmissions, we can use our understanding of how the epidemiology works to write down the likelihood of that process. So how likely was it that we would have missed case eight in 2005 and that case eight took nearly two years before between getting infected and infecting four and case eight infected two people. All of that stuff comes into this first part of the left-hand column. The phylogenies now, this big phylogeny has been divided up into lots of little phylogenies with different colors, right? This is all glued together, the pink part and the purple part and the blue and other blue part. And we're assuming that each one of these is taking place in a different person. So that means these little mini trees are all independent of each other which mathematically means we can write a likelihood down for the genetic part, the genetic data, through the phylogeny um, as a product of little simple things, and that's convenient and nice. Okay, so that's basically the whole idea. Um, here it is again in, I won't say it's in math, it's in kind of pseudo math. The likelihood of our transmissions given our fixed phylogeny is based on the likelihood of our transmission events and the likelihood of our phylogeny given the transmission events and our priors. Phylogeny given the transmission events is easy because it's our transmission events divided up into lots of little independent trees. And our likelihood of our transmissions come from our epidemic model. And we did some math that helped us to handle unsampled cases and finite time. Um, how many people here would say they like math? Okay, cool, great. So here's a bit of math. Um, I like math. I'm in a math department. Sometimes people don't like math. Um, if you don't like math, don't worry. Just, you know, ride, let the math ride through you and, and you'll hopefully enjoy it anyway. Okay, so in order to build up this likelihood, I said we're going to build up a likelihood that case A didn't get sampled, case 8 didn't get sampled, and he infected two people who got sampled, da, 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 right? So in order to build that up, we need a quantity we don't know. So we need the probability that somebody is unsampled, and all of their descendants are forever unsampled and they remain forever unknown to the process. Those are not people in our tree, of course, because the people in our tree are ancestral to our data somewhere. But we need this number. So the usual branching process thing to do would be to say, okay, the probability, this, this thing, let's, let's name it, P naught. It, in order to have this property that you are unsampled and forever all of your descendants, infections are unsampled, you have to yourself be unsampled. So put that here. And then no matter how many uh, individuals you infect, let's call those your kind of infectious offspring, you're in the branching process land, um, they all have to have this property too. They all have to be forever unsampled. Otherwise, if that's not true, one of your descendants will be sampled and you won't be in this, this first line anymore. Okay, so the probability you're unsampled and then the sum over K of all the different numbers of secondary infections you could have made, zero, one, two, three, four, five, blah, 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 you have that many offspring and they all have to be unsampled. Okay, so that's, you know, that's, I can just write that down. My sampling is pi, my probability, so one minus pi. I can sum from zero to infinity all the offspring you could have had, the probability you had that many. And then I have this bit, that they're unsampled. So, well, I don't know when you infected them, so I have to write down, let's say you infected them at time tau j, the jth one. This is the likelihood you infected them at time tau j, that's fg generation time, um, conditional on stopping the process at time t. And then here's our p naught again. So this p naught is over here, and then there's p naught in here. This is p naught of t for the time that this guy was unsampled, and this is p naught of tau j, the time that his unknown infectees were, were infected. Okay, so that looks hard. We struggled with this a bit. We tried different operators and things to try to solve this equation. And actually, it turns out that if you took second year math, the thing you learned in second year math is actually the, the thing that works to solve this equation. Um, 
this thing in brackets is red, as you can see. This thing is also red. These are the same. The red things are the same. And this equation comes from the fact that this thing in red actually just comes up j times, because we integrated out tau j. So this is just red thing to the power k. And that means we can use the generating function tool to get red thing to the power k into this equation here. So if you don't know generating functions, you won't follow that. That's cool. If you do, that's where this comes from. Um, OK, and we can solve this with the trapezoid method, which you learned in second year math, or first year math, or grade 12 math, or third year math, or some kind of math sometime. Um, and to do that, we need to exploit the assumption that f g of 0 is 0. So right when you get infected at that exact moment, you don't also infect your friend. One second later is cool, but right at that moment, um, you can't. Probably if you do one second later, this is going to cause numerical weirdness. OK, so then we can build up the likelihood of our whole transmission tree using this p naught of t. Um, so we can say, OK, well, if you, got, if you infected k people, but only m of them were sampled and had sampled descendants, then the other k minus m had this, and you need p naught to the k minus m. This whole, this, this solution of this allows us to build up this whole likelihood of the transmission tree. OK, so here's the, that, that's the end of the math, I think, um, sadly, because half the room likes math. Um, OK, so we start with a phylogenetic tree in units of time, which is given by the magic wand bioinformatics method that gives us the full truth. Um, and we start with some info for our epidemiological modeling, propose a coloring, who infected whom and when, compute its likelihood using the epidemiology model, which how long between sampling and infection, our special p naught that we just found by our trapezoid method, um, our unsampled cases, compute our likelihood, accept or reject, and continue. And at the end of this, you have, if it's converged, it's all nice, you have a posterior collection of colored trees, right? With, all of which include the information of who infected whom, and also when, and also how long it was between getting infected and getting sampled. All right. So we hope that this information is actually useful for public health. Um, who infected whom and when might be useful, and how long between these things might be useful. Um, we have an R package. You can do this yourself. There's a vignette up there. You can simulate. In fact, it's, this is the tree from that vignette. So if you go to the website, you'll see this tree. Xavier Didolo, at, uh, who was at Imperials, just moved to Warwick, um, developed the R package with us. OK, so to do this, you need your timed tree. You need sampling dates for your tips, which give, give you your timed tree. Um, you need the priors for the time it takes between getting infected and infecting your friends, months, years, days, minutes, um, between getting infected and getting sick enough that you go to the doctor and get sampled, um, the time when sampling stopped, and some information about your sampling rate. And what you get out is this posterior collection of all this useful stuff. Um, OK, so I'll show you a couple of results. This is from a 13-year outbreak of TB in Hamburg, the one that I showed you the, the zoom in for. There were 86 cases over 13 years. They did active case finding. Um, we used pretty wide priors. And here, the blue is the prior. That's how long it took between getting infected and infecting someone else. And this is how long it took between getting infected and infecting friends. The blue is the prior, and the bars are the posterior. So. Um, people were transmitting kind of fast. TB epidemiologists sometimes think that TB often sits dormant for 20 years. Um, in this case, now, of course, this is people that we found in the outbreak who had active TB, not the people that were infected now and haven't progressed yet for 20 years. But among these cases, we're finding they've actually been infected pretty recently. And there's a cool kind of Next stage in this story, Marcel Baer's group in Montreal just wrote a really great paper outlining lots of different data sources around TB um, having this property of, you know, most cases that you see are recent transmission within the past two years. Um, okay, and there were some unsampled cases. All right, we can also look at when cases were infected. Um, some of you heard me talk about Norway in the meeting we just had. Uh, we had a cluster of closely related TB cases from Norway, um, and cases tend to occur among people immigrating to Norway from somewhere else. And the Norwegian public health system has kind of implicitly assumed that they must have been infected before they came to Norway because TB rates in Norway are pretty low, so that's a kind of reasonable assumption. Um, so we did our, ran our method, 
and the red blobs here, each, each, each panel is a case, and the red blob is the posterior distribution of time when that case was infected. So you can see we can't pinpoint, you know, this guy was infected in 2007 in June. That might be the maximum, but it's really, really uncertain when they were infected based on this, this analysis. But if he moved to Norway in 2001, the probability that, that he was infected after that is really high. All of this posterior is after that. Um, this, this one, you know, moved to Norway pretty recently, likely infected earlier. Uh, some of these really credible that they were infected in Norway, also kind of credible that they weren't because we have this wide box of uncertainty. So we can actually estimate about 25% of the cases in the whole data set, not just in this little tight cluster, were probably infected in Norway, and that has public health consequences for how TB occurring in people from parts of the world where there's lots of TB in Norway is interpreted. Okay, so I'll talk about one more thing. Do I have a couple more minutes? Yeah, okay. Um, often, like in Norway, we have data that for TB, once we run our beyond the SNP threshold probability cutoff, we end up with lots of little clusters. And what I've told you about transphilo is that it takes one big tree and does this big inference on this one tree. Uh, but if you have lots of little trees, that's not that helpful because each little tree might not be good enough to estimate parameters and you know, run the model by itself, but all of them together might tell you something about the epidemiology in your, in your setting. Um, if you just put lots of little clusters into one big tree and they're separated by really, really long branches, then what will happen is Transphilo will spend all its time putting unsampled cases on the really long branches and not very much time exploring the clusters, and that's not good. So what we did was develop a way that Yang Weizhou from Imperial wrote a code, wrote code to run Transphilo simultaneously on lots of different input trees and share parameters between them. And we can do that taking in lots of posterior trans phylogenetic trees from one data set, or we can take lots of little clusters from the same community. Uh, I'll skip the formal framework, and I'll just say we did this with a long-term um, INH-resistant TB outbreak in London that's been going on since the 90s, believe it or not. Uh, we have about 350 sequences, 94 of which are identical in SNPs, so that's puzzling. Um, the outbreak was studied, there's a few papers about it, it showed signs of high transmissibility. Um, and previous analyses, of course, because 94 of these sequences have no SNPs, essentially concluded that we can't get anything from sequence data. Nonetheless, Public Health England is now routinely sequencing all of their TB cases. Um, so we reanalyzed this outbreak with Transphilo and we used lots of posterior timed phylogenetic trees from BEAST as inputs. And we got this. Um, the color is the time of sampling, so you can see how the outbreak started in the middle and then went outwards in this maximum a posteriori reconstructed transmission tree. Uh, so color looks very alarming because it just gets bright red. Um, we should probably make that some other color scheme. And then the shape is sampled or unsampled. So you can actually see there's some unsampled cases in here. And if you believed this and you really wanted to dig into this outbreak and look for unsampled cases, it would direct you to say, okay, maybe among contacts of this crowd over here, among contacts of this crowd over here, and again, thickness of the edges is about the posterior probability of the edge. So, so we hope this will be a tool that public health um, outbreak reconstructors can use. And we've talked to Public Health England about using it on some of their clusters. And then finally, we looked at, we have lots of other demographic data, and we looked at, since we don't know who infected whom, we can't really compare it to our extra data, whether the case was affected by alcohol or had a history of drug use or prison links or a history of homelessness. But we can relate our transphilo estimates of who might be a transmitter um, and who might infect unsampled cases and so on to those covariate data. So we can look at that. Affected by alcohol seems like an important one. So who is infecting unsampled cases? Who's infecting, infected by unsampled cases? Um, so that's, again, sort of in this line of where could we look for unsampled cases? And then finally, we trained some of our favorite machine learning algorithms to predict from our demographic and clinical and behavior social data who's going to be an estimated TB transmitter. So 
Um, and that should be an ER, sorry. This, this is a slightly older version of the talk, I don't know why. Um, okay, so someone who's an estimated or credible transmitter in our whole transphylo run, did they ever infect anybody or did they infect anybody enough of the time, half the trees, let's say. Um, we don't know the ground truth, so we use our transphylo estimates for the ground truth. And this is what we get. So we can predict whether someone is a credible TB transmitter from our covariate data with, you know, I don't know if you've seen these receiver operator characteristics. If you have, you know what this means. If you don't, don't worry about it. Um, we can predict it with an accuracy of broadly about 75%. So not terrible. Um, and we can extract the importance of the different features. So these top few are what's mainly contributing to that prediction, age, uh, history of being affected by alcohol, homelessness, ethnic group, history of drug use, kind of the things you would think in a setting like London that might be associated with TB. Um, smear status did not come up. Smear, positive smear status is here, so that's an interesting one. Prison links didn't really come up as that important. Um, okay, so I would say there are some limitations here. This idea that it's a two, obviously, you know, this idea that it's a two-stage process is a limitation. And this idea of kind of doing one analysis first and then doing a separate analysis to build in all our other data, it would be better to do, you know, one analysis that gets all the way from FASTQ files through timed trees, through um, transmission inference, through importance of these variables. That's all pretty much open. Right now, this is the best that, that we're able to do. Um, we have two R packages for both of these, Transpilo I showed you, and then the SNP clustering if you happen to have SNP data or sequence data for your infected individuals or in, a, in another system, dividing sequences into groups, understanding something about timing and clock processes, then you could look at this package. All right. I want to thank um, postdocs. James Stimson and Yang Wei Zhu, who developed the, James did the Beyond the SNP Threshold and Yang Wei did the parallel um, transpilo on the different trees at the same time. And then the rest of these folks uh, either were involved in transpilo or gave us data or both in Jen's case. Um, okay, thanks. No, it only, you get added to a cluster if there's anybody else in the cluster for whom you would be a match in the sense of having relatively few intermediate transmissions. And it's the same with SNPs. You would put people in if they're within 12 SNPs of any other case. They would don't have to be within that of every other case in the cluster. Yeah. yeah, so in both cases we did, I didn't show either of those. Um, in Transphylo we did simulations and looked at whether you could really estimate R0 and the answer is kind of sort of. Um, yeah, 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 it's stochastic. With the, with the clustering it's hard because let's say I have my simulated true clusters and they're all at least 50 SNPs apart, both methods is gonna, are going to do great. So I could easily design my simulations so that I could get a great answer from one and not the other one, depending how I simulate. So, so we did. We looked at whether our SNP, our trend, our probability method would do better at identifying direct transmissions. We used simulations for that, and it does do a little better than just a SNP cutoff. But again, you know, you can make up simulations. So. Yeah, so we, this was from a random forest method that was trained on one um, fold for cross-validation. So we haven't done tenfold cross-validation. This is, I think it's on one fold. Um, how you pull a rock out of that random forest model, um, he may have done a support vector machine model to get the ROC curve. I realize it is 7.15 on a Thursday night, so. <sighs>
<laughs> you might want to go home. Yeah, I think, yeah, you need environmental samples. Um, and then, yes, you could look at this idea of like combining the timing, especially if you know something about diversification in the environment versus in the host. Um, that could potentially be really interesting. Yeah, so I think that's a super interesting question. And one thing we're looking at is a, a different application than, than these ones, but we're looking at identifying successful small subclusters of sequences that show signs of success and trying to see if we can, again, train our machine learning favorite toolkit of machine learning to predict which small subsets of sequences are going to be successful into the next season. Um, so the common colds, there's so many colds around and they never sequenced and typed and there's major variants and people can keep producing them for weeks after they've had a cold and it's all sort of a disaster. But for flu, it's potentially really important to be able to keep track of that phylogeny over time and then design a vaccine for next year that is informed by as much data as we can, including tree shapes and tree clusters. Thank you. Thanks for having me.